Today, everyone knows about special effects, and what that usually means is CGI, computer-generated images. But in 1940, there were no such things as computers, and special effects was an umbrella term, incorporating a range of different devices supplied by various studio departments to create illusions on the screen. And these range from the work of matte artists and model makers to miniature sets and back projection, and from mechanical gadgets to the compositing of images in an optical printer. Today's special effects can often cost more than the cast, the director, the script and the sets put together, driving the budget of a $10 million movie up to $50 million or more. But in the 1940s, the object of special effects was to keep costs down. And because one of the priorities of RKO was that Wells must not exceed his budget, there were considerably more special effects in Citizen Kane than in the average Hollywood film of the time. Here are some of the ways by which Wells and his team saved money. <laughs> Take this shot of the Daily Enquirer employees watching from a window as Kane arrives with his fiancée. Emily Monroe Norton. She's the niece of the President of the United States. President's niece, huh? Before he's through, she'll be a President's wife. The window is the only part of the frame that was actually constructed. The building itself and all other surroundings were painted by a matte artist. The shooting script says that Kane's Xanadu is in Florida, overlooking the Gulf of Mexico. But this procession of cars with Kane and his guests heading for a picnic in one of the few location scenes was actually shot at Malibu in California. To simulate the Gulf Coast rather than the West Coast, most of the frame is painted out and the hills of Malibu are replaced by the flatter terrain and the vegetation of Florida. Such diverse visuals were combined in an optical printer using a system that had been employed since the early days of sound and had been pioneered by RKO's Linwood Dunn, seen here with the first optical printer he'd designed and built. Some of his earliest and most impressive work in this area was in the 1933 classic King Kong. One particularly fine example of the capabilities of the optical printer is this shot of Kane standing in the doorway at the far background of what appears to be a large and elaborate set. In fact, there was no set. This scene is composed of three separately photographed elements. In the centre background stands Kane, presented in an image reduction process known as miniature projection. The area around him is a matte painting which includes a very convincing image of Kane's reflection on the floor all of which saved an enormous amount of money on expensive construction. Throughout the film, there are numerous examples of special effects that still rate as among the best of that period. This is one of Greg Toland's most inventive in-camera effects. Through a combination of flyaway sets and imaginative lighting, the camera moves from outside of the skylight to the inside of the El Rancho nightclub through a single flash of lightning. That worked beautifully. But there's one instance where the needs of Director Wells clashed with technological limitations. Here we have a projected ocean background and a shrieking cockatoo as Susan walks across the set. But look carefully. An unintended print-through from the projected background shows in the cockatoo's eye just before it flies off. If Wells had not placed the bird so close to the camera, this wouldn't have happened. But he wanted the cockatoo to scream and fly away as a shock device to grab the audience's attention. This, though, was an isolated instance in a film whose special effects still pass muster and more to this day.